He is an entrepreneur who wants to become an entrepreneur. Can you raise your hand? Almost everyone, right? It's interesting, a few weeks back, three weeks ago, I was talking at Station F to 200 students from HEC. And I asked them two questions. Actually, I asked them three questions. First, who wants to work in finance? How many of them do you think? Raise their hands. 200 of them. How many? One. One out of 200. Then ask them, who wants to become an entrepreneur? How many of them? Everyone else. Then, how many of you want to become a social entrepreneur? 20% of them. Yeah. You want to become a social entrepreneur? Who wants to become social entrepreneurs here? Social, yeah? Some of you. Um, so you're not sure. Maybe, maybe not. Um, something important about entrepreneurship, um, you need to define your mission. And when I'm saying this, sometimes it looks you know, pretty obvious. It's not. My mission when I started my first venture at 17 was to make money, really. And because I knew at the time that making money will make, just make me decide everything I want in the future. Because I knew that money is power. So money for me was first, I want to protect my mom. That was the, the, the start of everything. I want to give her everything she needed. But beside this, I said, if I have money, I will really be able to define and to decide the next chapters of my life. I'm not saying that should be your decision or your choice or why you will do you know, the hard work that you will be doing, but that you, you know this for the entrepreneurs and you will see this quickly for the future entrepreneurs. It's really hard. <laughs> so if you don't have this mission, it will be almost impossible to succeed. The reason why I've been successful in the last 25 years running businesses is certainly not because I'm, I'm more clever than someone else. I'm for sure just more hard worker than most people. And even today. The reason why Epic is pretty successful is because we work like freaking dogs. So the mission is clear. We fight for the underserved. What could be better? That's the reason why RAF PA, Anita over there, people from my team are working that hard because we know why we're doing But what we see also is a new breed of entrepreneurs. I just want to mention a couple of them. One is um, Sekil Patron. Have you ever heard about Sekil Patron? Who has bought a um, product from Sekil Patron? Can you raise your hand? Oh, yeah, half of you. So I hope the other half will buy this product soon. Um, I just want to explain Sekil Patron quickly. Sekil Patron, three years ago, two years ago, not 25 years ago, two entrepreneurs decided to fight the um, brands like Danone and Nestle. Said, we can do something better. And for them, what is better? Said, we need to pay correctly the producers. B, we need maybe a better product. Means less GMO and better product. So. They didn't decide and they didn't define a price for a milk or a liter of milk. They ask us, citizens, consumers, how much should cost a liter of, li of milk? With seven questions. It's very, it's very clever. Seven questions. The question was, do you think we should pay correctly a producer? Yes. Four cents more. Do you think we should have less GMO in the milk? Yes. Six cents more. Do you think the producer should have one week vacation per year? One week. Yes, no, sure. Yes. Thank you for them. Um, three, three cents more. At the end of it, the price is, for the ones who have been buying milk from Sekil Patron, 99 cents. But to get to the 99 cents, then, they had to reduce everything else. Other costs, advertising or marketing to sales. So then we won't communicate. So no communication at all. Two, we have no one will be selling the milk. So how they've been successful, what do you think? No, zero marketing spend. What, consumers? Yeah. What? Yeah, that's, that's us. Us saying that's a, that's a product we'll be buying. And then they got 9,000 people like us 
consumers and how they would be working is very good. You, for example, you are from Sekil Patron or you are just um, one of those 9,000 people. You go to Carrefour, or Franprix, or Monoprix, or Lidl, pick one of them, and you ask to talk to the person running the dairy. I said, can I talk to you? I said, yeah, sure. I love your Auchan, but I would really like having this product on the shelf. And if you don't have the product on the shelf in a month, I will stop coming. And by the way, I will use this beautiful application from Sikil Patron. I will push that button and there will be a message going to my network saying that they, should come, they shouldn't come buying product here because you don't understand what's coming. You don't pay attention to something very important. Is how we share what we have. And then Carrefour opened the door first. Two years after, two years, it's the first brand uh, in France selling milk. First one. So it's interesting, and that's why I want to share this with entrepreneurs, because sometimes people will tell you it will never work. And most of the time they're right, it will never work. <laughs> so let's be clear, it's super hard to succeed. But sometimes even if people believe so, you should be just even crazier. I said, you know what, I will do it. What is interesting is you see more and more brands like this. And whatever you will be doing in the future, adding this social driven or social good component in your business is more than, more than important. And I want to share another example of another successful, su successful story. Lyft um, in the US. Lyft, you, you know, it's the other um, Uber in the US. Two years ago, and again, I'm mentioning this because Uber started doing really creative things um, two years ago. Lyft, at the time, had 6% of market share, 6%. And they, um, where it was even hard for them to raise money. Then Uber started, started doing, oh, it's not Uber, it's the CEO of Uber, started doing just led, led, you know, many different crazy things. And then a few people, back to ce qu'il patron, like us, starting the hashtag delete Uber. How many, how many people, how many US customers you think have canceled, have deleted the Uber app in a month? How many you think? 10%? That's pretty, pretty you know, optimistic. Um, 400,000 people. So you still need to commute, right? So people move from Uber to the second one. And Lyft, if you know Lyft, Lyft at the very start put social good everywhere. They were the first to tip the driver. The first, they were the first to rent up your ride to a cause. So it was six, you know, six euros or six dollars point five. You were able to put at seven dollars and then the 50 cents more will go to social cause then people switched there. It became the second application um, on the App Store. And at the end of it, when they went public, they had 26% of market share, from 6% to 26%. Why? Because we, collectively, are activists. 20 years ago, being an activist was more working for Greenpeace. So not everyone was able to do it. Being an activist today is you, it's you, it's you, it's people I know. And we can do it. We can do it because now we won't work for businesses and, and organizations who won't share this vision. This vision is clear. We cannot have everything without sharing. You know, that's not doable. And the people will be on stage um, on, on the panel or like-minded people. And I will just mention one I know pretty well, is Eric from Evaneos. When we had this conversation with Eric, um, I think two years ago, about just one product, very successful entrepreneur, I'm sure all of you, you know Evaneos, maybe some of you are using Evaneos, I hope so. Um, it was, it was um, an entre successful entrepreneur, but saying, you know, I will maybe do and I will give um, when I will be 
very successful, basically, when I will sell, when I will sell my business, when my business will go public. And we got this conversation many, many times with entrepreneurs like with you saying, I want to do more, I want to share, but I need to succeed first. And what we answered to Eric, I'm not sure where Eric is, um, but said, don't wait. Just pledge a percentage of your shares now. So 1%, 2%, 5%, whatever you want. It's your decision. But the message as entrepreneurs that we are to everyone else is very, is very strong. Is we'll be, and we'll be doing everything we can to be successful. Let's be clear. But we know that at the core of what we'll be doing, sharing will be there. And the, in the conversation we'll be having with our employees, with our potential investors, with the partners, even within, with our family, we can explain also why we're doing what we're doing. And talking about investors is also important. Any investors here? Be careful. Usually you cannot film. Um, no? One? No? <sighs> Too bad. Um, so um, even with investors, when you will run your business and when you will be raising money, and as you know, you have a lot of money uh, in the market those days. Um, pick your investor, if you are able to pick your investor. Ask questions. When we're talking about ESG, because that's a big question um, those days, so that's usually what investors could ask you. What are your, really just the, the norm you're following? Are you just good following all those you know, very important and positive norms? Maybe you can also do the same. You can ask your investors if uh, what they're doing with the, uh, the money you will help them to make. Maybe you can ask, we can be more activists. We are working with some investors. Uh, we have a list of investors here in France who have, who have signed the pledge, the same as Eric from Evaneos did sign. They are giving a percentage of their carry. So the carry, as you know, is where the, the money they will be making in the future, the kind of bonus. And we're saying, just, just pledge 1%, 2 5%. Whatever you want. But for us, in the near future, no VCs should run a venture fund without this thinking at the core of it. Whatever we do, whatever we make, whatever we're able uh, to structure you know, for our, even a family or a business has to be shared. Um, and that's barely just what we think, and that's what we do at Epic. Um, so I'm not sure um, if Vlad, how much time I have? Two more minutes, one more minute before questions? Vlad, five more minutes, okay, thank you. Um, so Epic um, is, is, is a structure, it's a startup, by the way. Just I started everything four years ago with that thinking, saying, how is it possible to have so much money there so many great entrepreneurs, social entrepreneurs over there, and sometimes the connection um, is not working. How is it possible to see so much money there and so many people just suffering there and we even don't see this anymore? And what's interesting, uh, you know, as an entrepreneur, I've been working and I've been using design thinking and open innovation as in terms that you all know very well here. That's what I've been using for the, last, for the last 25 years of my life. Every time I was doing something in mobile, in social media, in the internet, everything, every startup that I've I launched in the past, I was using exactly the same um, uh, easy steps. I said, but I should be able to do something within this industry. And I traveled the world. I did my market research. I went to see so many people saying, what's wrong with you? How is it possible? What kind of people we are? Can, how can we still accept this? We've been accepted. We have been able to accept things who are just unacceptable. I'll give you an example. One. Today, a big firm did just fire hundreds of people. What happened with the stock price of this organization the same day? Do you think the stock price went up or went down? Went up. And it's normal. We fire people. That's not normal. When, if we fire people, how could we be able to accept that 
people will make money on this. So maybe you will think, I'm a sweet believer, I'm just a dreamer. Maybe I'm a dreamer. But you know what? More and more people are joining us because this is not acceptable. And you know what? I'm not the only one. The, the students I mentioned earlier, they don't want to work for those businesses anymore. And it's harder and harder. Why Epic is successful? Because more and more people want to be part of positive stories. You want to work for organizations that make sense, that bring purpose. So most of you will become entrepreneurs, so you will build your own purpose. And you will provide this purpose to your own employees. But some of you or friends of you are working for different businesses. And what we see more and more, they leave. They don't work for those organizations. And that's good. Um, and what we're always saying with the team is how we can be activists. Being activists is stop working for the wrong organizations. Not easy, but you know, 20 years ago, my generation, we didn't care. We want to have a big company car, a big check. We want to have an, um, the, an office by, by ourselves. That was the objective. The objective of you guys, m most of you, all of you, is very different from this. And it's a good thing. But you need to go further than this. Stop buying product that doesn't match what we think is crucial, is important. I'll give you another example. Can you just raise your hand if you think it's fair that Apple is not paying taxes in France? Anyone believe it's normal that someone who is making 60 billion of dollars of profit, profit per year is not paying taxes here? No one. Can you raise your hand now if you have an iPhone? Go ahead, please, make my day. <laughs> so, and that's basically just, so some of you, and I do think, I do think, you can easily just cancel or delete the Uber app. It's not that hard. You know, you switch, it will take you five minutes. You need to put your credit card, just information. Changing your phone could, you know, take more than five minutes, still. What we see, this brand will be in trouble. And all the other brands who don't understand that, you know, running a business is not only just about just making more profit than the others, will be in trouble. Why? Because in France, it's 66 million people who are consumers. And you have seen this for the last six months, every Saturday, um, that a lot of people think differently. And th they are activists. Maybe they are just showing just a different kind of activism. But activism can take different shape. That's what we see more and more. So that's what we do to Epic. We travel the world every year to select very few organizations, very few organizations, like a VC. Last year, we have analyzed 4,000 applications. We have selected five, like a VC. And after those five organizations, or 28 organizations now within the portfolio, we help them to scale, to grow. We fund them. So for this, we have three or three channels. The first one is we go to 15, 16, 15 cities around the world to convince people with money that it's the right time um, to give. So Epic, it's important, has no business model. So if anyone here wants to be part of Epic, if you give one dollar or one share, whatever, 100% of this will go to the organizations. I'm self-funding everything myself. So all you know, the team, the six offices across the world, has been, is paid by me. So it means that it's very transparent and very clear about where the money goes. That's one. Two, with businesses, that's how we work also. And that's a pledge for entrepreneurs I just mentioned, or with VCs. That's what we do, and that's how I've been working with Eric from Evaneos. We are building new solutions that people can just give, can share, um, and that's barely just what we do. I'll give you a last example on this side for if you like rugby, this Saturday, there is the top 15, 14 final. Um, and we have been building a sharing block, a Stade de France, where you have 750 seats will be part of the giving block. What it means, it means this tickets, a slice of it will go to social good. And we've been doing this at Olympia. We're doing this more and more. And we're doing this in other countries. The goal is in the future, why in every single stadium, in every single just theater, we can have this. That's what we are trying to, uh, to push. Um, that's what we do at Epic. Um, and, and that's why I was, I was very happy just coming, uh, coming here tonight. Uh, A, because we are big fans of the family and, and the family is also part of Epic. 
Um, so it's also important. And because you are those activists. Um, and in, for years and years, we were thinking that other people can do it. And most of the time, we were thinking the government can do everything. It's not true. They are doing everything they can. But it's on us. Um, and that's why I want to share. And please join us. Um, we have the team. We have some people are staying here. If you have IDs, uh, because most of the IDs we are, uh, we are now pushing, not only coming from us, are coming from the network. So thank you again. And good luck for all your journeys. <laughs> well, how are you? Good. <laughs> Thanks for joining us. Um, so very classic. I think I'm going to uh, just ask you to uh, introduce yourself in your business very quickly. Let's do this uh, quick roundtable so that everyone can have a clear view of who is who and who is uh, doing what. Uh, Eric, maybe you want to go first? Yeah. So I'm Eric. I'm co-founder of Evanios, which is a travel marketplace. So the idea is to connect travelers with local agents uh, all over the world to create uh, multi-day uh, tours. So uh, we let the customers benefit from local expertise. This is basically the idea. Nice. Hi, everybody. I'm Thomas. I'm the CEO of Pinot Bleu. Um, we are building the wine uh, brand, uh, wine organic brand, and we fight for a new way of producing wine and a new way of consuming also wine. Okay, so for all the wine lovers in the room, here's your guy tonight. Uh, hi, I'm Elizabeth. I created 25 years ago uh, something that's both a think tank and a consultancy which is called Utopies, which was the first uh, sustainability consultancy uh, in France, still alive and kicking. And uh, we are also the country partner for the Big Corp certification, which is part of what I'm going to talk about tonight. Awesome. Thanks, all. Um, I guess so to kick off the conversation, Elizabeth, I have a question for you. Because um, I think most of the people who are not super clear about what we mean by uh, making an impact or, you know, doing the good, um, is this really just about um, being conscious of your environmental issues or is it something else or is it much broader than that? It's it, not clear for everyone. <laughs> it's, it can be almost anything you can think of and that's the, the magic of entrepreneurship, I would say, but... Uh, clearly, we have. It's about, and this is referring to my retweet of your tweet previously. In the <laughs> about every startup is a social, social startup. Maybe we can discuss that. I'm not so sure, unfortunately. But uh, no, I think it, uh, entrepreneurs can solve pretty much any problems, uh, in, including really important problems of our times. And that's what impact is about. Is about not only solving, like, oh, am I going to wear. Uh, pink or uh, green uh, stuff tonight, <laughs> which is a kind of small problem that some brands do solve, but, uh, but it's about solving important issues of our times, including environmental issues, but also social issues. So really, uh, maybe when you think of impact business, business for good, you can you, you immediately think of solving environmental issues like uh, uh, you, renewable resources, renewable energy, whatever, not wasting food, clothing, or whatever you can think about, or green cars, or green, greening almost everything, because everything needs to be greened. Uh, but no, there are many, many companies that have an impact. Uh, we, we, Alexander mentioned C'est qu'il patron, but you can think of Tom's shoes, that uh, every time you buy a pair of shoes, they give one to a child in need. You can think of Camif, which is focused on furniture made in France, so really, or, or uh, 1083 for jeans, uh, which is also about made in France. Veja shoes is about fair trade. So you, you, there are many, Shinola, uh, this watch is a uh, made in Detroit, and it's the, the purpose is really to bring back industrial jobs, quality industrial jobs in Detroit, which is a very, uh, which went bankrupt, as you may know. Uh, so Newman Zone, which is the food uh, brand created by Paul Newman initially, is giving back all profits to charity. So there are many, many ways that a company can give back. Yeah, okay, very interesting. So I guess um, in terms of this duality between um, doing the goods and yeah, and also <laughs> uh, uh, focusing on your business and the growth. 
um, Eric, I know that you, your company is evolving in a very competitive industry. Um, I think you said it was about 300 million of job employments globally, the tourism industry. So how did you manage to launch your company in this industry in the context and then also focusing on, okay, I'm going to just think about all the stakeholders and uh, make everything so that we are fair to them? How, how did you manage that? Um, yeah, it's true that tourism is a big industry. It represents almost 10% of global GDP. So uh, it's an enormous industry. And my belief is that it's not going in the right direction. When you, I mean, when you see how tourists travel today, and you believe, I mean, and two, 20 years from now, there will be twice much as tourists uh, as today, uh, especially coming from Asia. And people concentrate a lot in the same places today. So I don't see how sustainable it can be. Uh, we will destroy the places and the cultures, and almost but lots of them have already uh, already disappeared. So it's a big threat uh, for our planet. Actually, tourists can be a real threat for uh, for our world. Ten, forty-six percent of the tourists in the world they concentrate in ten destinations only. So uh, there are more than two hundred like countries in cities? the world. Like ten cities. Sorry. Ten like ten cities, literally. Ten countries, I would say. Ten countries. Yes. Okay. And wow. in those countries, yes, they concentrate in the same places. So. Almost all tourists of the world, they go in the same places, and this is not sustainable. So this is something I wanted to fight. And also what I realized a few years ago is that um, the local um, communities, they don't benefit from tourism. There were some studies made in Thailand, for example, that showed in 2009 that 70% of the money spent by the tourists actually left the destinations because most of the hotels, they belong to foreigners. Uh, because tourists, they want to drink Coke uh, even uh, in the, the forest uh, destination, so they have to import food. So, I mean, the money is leaving really the destinations and don't benefit to, to locals. So, we wanted to, to find a kind of solution or to start something that would fight those two things, over tourism and, um, and uh, leakage effect. Leakage is the money leaving the destinations. And actually, what we, uh, what we wanted to, um, to, to... I mean, the idea we had it was to combine... I mean, to help travelers being more curious, because it's a lot about curiosity. If people always go to the same places, it's because they're not curious, because media, TVs show the people always the same things. Uh, just to give you an example, I was in uh, Santorini in Greece uh, two years ago. I mean, everybody goes there. You go in the street, and everybody takes the same picture of the same sunset. That Actually, you don't need Instagram. to go there to do that. You can download it on Google if you want this picture. Um, so it has no sense, actually, and I was part of them. I'm not smarter than anyone. I just want to make things better. Um, so we have to help people more, being more curious. So we try on the website to showcase much more destinations and to, uh, um, to create off the beaten track uh, offers. So this is one thing. And the second thing is about uh, leakage effect, and we made a study recently, and actually when we travel through Evaneos, 70% of the money that you spend stay in the destination, because our local agents, they select local hotels, small hotels, with local owners, they try to help the travelers to eat local food, so it's really about educating travelers and local agents to, to, to create better trips, I would say, and to spread the tourist flow within the destination, so we don't need all I mean, if you go, I mean, we are French. We all know that France is much more than Eiffel Tower, Notre Dame, and Bordeaux. Uh, it's much more than that. So uh, my idea is to give this sense to uh, everybody for all destinations. How do you track that? Like in terms of data that you focus on, how do you manage to do that? So, um, I mean, as I said, 46% concentrate in 10 destinations in the world, and for us, 50% they go in uh, uh, 70 destinations. So this is much more spread than the market uh, because we selected lots of local agents uh, proposing amazing things all around the world. Um, for example, in a destination like India, we have 20 local agents. Some of them are in Rajasthan where everybody goes, but most of them are outside of Rajasthan and it's possible through Vanillos to organize amazing trips outside of the main cities. And we have 13, we today have 1,300 local agents in 160 destinations. So we really map the world with different type of expertise, themes. Um, and yeah, I love to say that you can do everything you, you want on Evanios. Yeah. And I guess the goal is also to expand even more 
the, the travel agents? Yes, we want to expand the travel agents, but also the, 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 um, the source markets, because we launched Evanios in France, so we helped French travelers to travel. So uh, after that, we launched Italy, then Spain, so now we are in 11 countries, and we recently launched the US and Canada. So we want to help US and Canadian travelers to, uh, to travel smart, in a smarter way, and uh, it's not very easy, uh, as you can imagine. <laughs> well, I don't know. <laughs> Um, okay, uh, Thomas, you are in the wine industry, yeah. um, and if I want to ask a sort of provocative question, I would say, I mean, the wine is natural already, it's supposed to be natural, so suppose, yeah. what different, you know, what are you doing different in yeah. terms of your products and the service you're providing? You know, 80% of wines uh, for B2C are bought in supermarkets, so uh, people are very lost when we buy wine. Um, moreover, wines or the wine um, producing is 3% of agriculture in France, but 20% of pesticides we put, all right? Um, the grapes are the first fruit uh, in terms of pesticides. So um, it's really a, a concern for the wine producers, for the consumers, also for the biodiversity. So. Um, uh, when we, we buy wine, we, we drink something, but we don't really know precisely what we drink. So with Pinot Bleu, we want to solve that issue. Um, we know uh, farmers or wine growers who produce very, very good wines uh, for a very good price. They're just uh, like magicians. And we select their wines, and we want to make you... Uh, buy and consume the wines um, to promote the work and also to, to change the way you, um, you consume wine and change the way we, we, we consume like, uh, more than wine, but uh, also... How come things? there is a lack of awareness, especially in France, or I guess in the world, on the fact that you said the grapes are the fruit with the most yeah. pesticide in it? I yeah. mean, no one knows that really. No. Um, it's pretty concerning. Uh, how come? Yeah, like, we no don't one know knows that. that. Uh, it's part of our missions to <laughs> to say it. Um, maybe because uh, you eat apples, but you don't not uh, you don't eat directly the the, the grapes. You drink the wine. You, you it's a bottle. It's not grapes. So it's kind of different. Um, and no one says it because uh, all the market is on on, on this type of production. Um, Producing organic wines is very uh, another cost. Uh, you, you have to work uh, way better and way more to produce it. Um, so, um, so, yeah, that's why. You yes. Yeah. Obviously, and so um, I know that you've just been certified uh, B Corp. Yeah certification. Um, we'll get back to you, but before that, I have a question for Elizabeth, then, <laughs> uh, because you have to tell us, you have to explain us what is B Corp and uh, yeah, what, what you are doing through this certification in France. Okay, so B Corp, the B in B Corp stands for Benefit Corporation. Um, it's um, both a, a certification and a community of businesses that was created in 2006 in the US by three entrepreneurs. Uh, one of whom had sold his company to uh, an investment fund who said, yes, I'm going to keep doing everything you did great for employees and staff. And of course, after a few months, they did nothing of what was previously the, uh, the best practice of this, this company. So he felt something needed to be done to um, embed the commitment of a business in the business so that whatever happens, you sell it, you, you, the, the founder dies, whatever, uh, the commitment will go on. Okay, so that was the, the, the initial idea. So they went with two projects, in fact. So they created the B Lab, which is the NGO behind B Corp. And they created two things. One is the certification, and I'll get back to it. The other one is a legal status in the US called Benefit Corporation. So B Corp is the certification, Benefit Corporation is the legal status. Very similar to what France is now doing, thinking we're the first ones in the world, which is not true, with Entreprise à Mission in the Loi Pact, okay? which is a very good thing, by the way. Uh, so coming back to the certification, uh, the certification is based on something, an assessment, 
which is called the BIA, Business Impact Assessment, which is, I must say, the only tool I know, which is, I'm, I'm not working for B Corp, I'm just the country partner and promoting it because we, we feel that's a tremendous tool. Uh, so it's the only tool and the only certification for sure, which is free and online. So any of you for your business, you want to do it tomorrow, you want to test, take the BIA, the, the assessment, you do it online, it's free, you bcorporation.net, you have it in French and in English, in a short version that you can try just to see where you... Say you so 200 questions adapted to your sector of activity, to your industry, obviously, because if you're doing travel, you're not doing wine, so it's not exactly the same sustainability issues. Um, obviously, the pesticides are relevant to Thomas, but not <laughs> exactly to Eric, as opposed to local impact, local employment, which is relevant for both, and uh, plain uh, impact on uh, uh, climate, which is more relevant to him than to him, even though uh, we can, this is something that can be discussed. Some wines do actually travel by plane. But anyway, so 200 questions adapted to your sector, to your industry, and to your geography because obviously a local regulation does not request the same uh, thing in the US and in France. Um, so you take the, the assessment uh, and it's on governance, on products, on practices, on how do you produce, whatever, everything, including philanthropy uh, to Alexander uh, and Epic Foundation. So everything. Um, and, and this gives you, an, and it gives you a, a mark out on 200 points. So most companies, like 80,000 companies who have taken the BIA, the average uh, grade they got is 55, okay? And those are companies who are interested in having an impact, so most of them are already committed to sustainability, social responsibility, whatever, okay? They think they're good. Uh, the average score is 55. You need to be over 80 uh, to, to be certified as a B Corp, okay? So if you take Patagonia, I think their score is 100 and 56, so very high. I think there, there are some uh, companies who have higher scores, but most of them, they're eight. if you're 80.3, it's okay. You're so you can be certified, okay? And so this is for free. You get your, your score, and if you're over 80 and you're interested in the certification, then you say, okay, I'm interested in the certification, and B-Lab, not us, will do the audit and ask you, so they don't come to visit you, but they ask you very precise documents, very precise questions on pretty much all of your um, answers, meaning that probably the scores, the self-assessment that you do in the beginning, the, the score will go down a bit with the audit. Uh, it's very, very seldom it goes up. <laughs> Most of the time it goes a bit down. Um, but, but that's a very interesting process anyway. Even if you're below 80, even if you're not interested in B Corp, which is my point, they're like impact is something you measure. Otherwise, it's mm -hmm. greenwashing. So how many companies uh, have been trying to get the certification in France to have a sort of stats? How many have been trying? trying? I don't have the number in mind, but we have a community. Utopy was the first one in 2014. Um, so that's pretty much four years ago. Then in 2015, we decided B-Lab was uh, creating a European office. They asked us to whether you want, we wanted to be the country partner for France, which is pretty much what we were already doing, promoting sustainability with companies anyway. So this was just a tool that, uh, and it's for free, so it's uh, very interesting to, to promote to any uh, entrepreneur, whether big or small, and we have very small ones. The, one of the smallest one is Quiz, that does um, a little gourd for kids, uh, for apple puree, whatever, uh, that you can reuse. Uh, so there are three, I think now there are five maybe, but when they were certified, there were three. And as you may know, Emmanuel Faber and Danone is the largest uh, uh, B Corp now in the world, because they have one third of their business units that are uh, B Corp certified, including the largest one, which is Danone USA. So f from very tiny companies to big ones, in France we have the community to date is about uh, between 70 and 80. But what we've been trying to do is to have uh, not the family, but the family games, you know, the seven families in France, les sept familles. So you have families of the Med in France. We have Camif, families from Consommation Collaborative, Collaborative Consumption. We have Ulule, La Ruche Kidiwi, families from Fairtrade. We have Veja, families from, uh, for, from um, companies committed to the environment. We have Nature et Découverte. Uh, we have Squeeze that I just mentioned. Cogent since yesterday. Um, so a lot of very, very uh, diverse profiles. So many ways to have an impact to your yeah, 
initial question. But all of them, they're above 80, and you get the certification, something important, for three years, okay? So it's not like we think that entrepreneurs and big ops thinks that entrepreneurs have something else to do than just assessing their impact over and over and over, and we know it takes time. So you don't do it every year, because otherwise you would like forget about your business, forget about improving your impact and just measure. Keep your <laughs> keep your spend your whole time measuring. So you just do it every three years, and this leaves you time also because the questionnaires evolves over time. You have a yeah, it's reviewed every eighteen months. The whole context. So evolves. you need to progress between yep. two assessments, otherwise you, you you your score is going down. Okay. So because I guess it's a lot of involvement and commitment from the companies. You mean doing the questionnaire. Doing the questionnaire. Yes, doing but less the whole than process. being a committed company anyway. But then, I mean, do they see an impact on their um, on their business and on the yeah on the, the core of their business once they got a certification? Oh, we can ask Thomas, but I think I'm there, ask there, Thomas, there's one, one rule uh, between in the co Bicop community, which is interdependence. So they kind of uh -huh. do a lot of business together. Like we have Microdon, who's doing the Arondi Solidaire also, and uh, they became a Bicop pretty much in, in the initial first uh, 15 companies. They were also Nature et Découverte, and they uh, worked together on putting the Arondi Solidaire in uh, Nature et Découverte stores. That's just an example. Patagonia, uh, who was one of the first Bicop in the US, and it's also a benefit corporation by legal status, um, uh, is working a lot with other B Corp certified uh, suppliers. Supplier. Like, uh, oh, yes. Yeah, for okay. many things that they yeah. sell that are not Patagonia, uh, with the Patagonia brand, they come sure. from B Corps. Uh, I think their supplier of wool in, uh, mm -hmm. in uh, Latin America is a B Corp certified company. So, so this is part of what you do. And then something else, which is for us, for example, as a consultancy, um, we committed to pick up and then we wanted to improve our scores. So we said, okay, we're going to go, uh, we're going to improve our scores. But most what we work with is mostly HR, so people. So we decided we should also commit to the, to becoming a great place to work certified company. So we improved that. So obviously it pushes you to improve, which for a consultancy in terms of attracting talents, retaining talents, obviously yeah, makes becoming a, a better employer, it should make a difference at the end of the year. Thank you. So. Thomas, can you tell us about the process from a founder perspective and why you, decide to, uh, why you decided to just do the certification, the whole process, and what do you expect from, from it? Yeah, at the very beginning of my uh, entrepreneur journey, I was sure I wanted to make a business the, that has sense, um, impact or sense. Um, I really wanted to do it li uh, like that and with a, a new way of thinking. Um, when I learned about B Corp, I don't know really how, maybe because I, I'm a huge fan of Patagonia, but uh, I thought uh, that will fit to uh, my view of uh, doing business. I mean, making money is a, is a cool thing, and it's uh, obviously uh, w we need to, to be ambitious like in a business way, uh, but that can be made also with a, a lot of sense for my team, for the, the people around Pinot Bleu and for the, the, the consumers. Um, so it was like obvious to, to be ambitious and, and, and to become a B Corp. Then we, we made everything you explained uh, with the assessment, etc. So uh, it took like um, nine, nine months. So it's quite, quite long. Uh, we are also the a, whole a, process? A nine small months? team. Okay. Yeah. Um, <laughs> the audits, right? uh, to, yeah okay. With the audit. B between the time we say, all right will be a B Corp at the time we uh, were sure. a B Corp. And now for us it's a proof that we are very ambitious for business, also for good. Uh, it's also a proof for companies who work with us. And a little example, I, I had the chance to explain it or to explain what we do uh, with Pinot Bleu to uh, Nicolas Hulot when he was uh, at the Ministry of uh, Ecology and he asked his team to meet us, and now we are the supplier of the, the French Ministry of Ecology because mm -hmm. we are a B Corp. They had Classy. They, yeah, thank you. They have uh, they had, uh, already uh, only organic wines, but they saw in uh, a way of making business that, yeah, the wines are organic, uh, but we go far beyond that. It's uh, a whole way of uh, building the company. Uh, with a social way, uh, ecological way also. So um, 
it's not not only organic. Uh, uh, sure, you are matching their values. Yeah, precisely. Thank you. Um, um, yeah, speaking about the way you build your company, Eric, you you pledged through Epic. Um, can you tell us about the rationale behind uh, why you decided to do it, and uh, what was the process like, and maybe why um, a few such a few amount of founders are doing it right now? Is it you think a lack of awareness? Same, or what's what would be the reason? Yes, probably. I, I think few people, few founders know about it. Um, and why I did that, it was not rational at all, so I have no rationale. Uh, it was, as Alexandre explained, a discussion with him. Um, and I explained to him that if I was successful one day, if I would sell the company, I would probably uh, run my own projects because I have some ideas and uh, I didn't want to give him money for, for conducting other uh, projects. So I wanted to do it myself. Uh, but he said, okay, you can do that, but what is 1%, uh, what is 2%? And it's true that 1%, if you are successful, is not a, I mean, something that will change your life. So uh, I said yes. Um, and if I'm not successful and if I sell my company for 100 euro, I don't think he will ask for the 1 euro. Uh, so it's not a big risk for me. I mean, it's, uh, if it's successful, I will give a part of the money to, uh, to the foundation. And actually, I think I can choose also the, 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 the associations, uh, the foundations I, I, I will give to. Um, so, so I just think it's good. It's a way to give back because I receive so much as an entrepreneur from, I mean, the state, from uh, um, from other people, from the employees. Uh, so uh, just, it's a way, I mean, I think I'm lucky. I mean, it's just, it's a lot of work. It's, a, I think, some talent, but it's a, also a, a lot of luck. So I think I'm lucky and I will give um, back one day. So, I mean, that's it. And how does it reflect on your employer brand? For example, would uh, and your... Sorry, just yeah. and you asked me what is the process. Yeah. Uh, the process is that he sent me a letter I had to sign. I signed the letter and that's it. So, uh, uh, really? Yeah. Just like that? It's, it's really easy. <laughs> but it's, it's, it will be probably so more complicated the, the, the day I will give the money. Uh, but okay. <laughs> for the moment, it's really easy. Yeah, it seems easier than the B Corp certification process. Definitely. Um, all right. Yeah, I wanted to discuss the, the impact on the employer brand because I guess when um, some candidates, uh, employees want to join Evaneos um, and they know about your, your values and, for example, the pledge, do you think it makes a difference um, for them? Uh, so about the pledge, this is the first time I speak about that publicly. publicly. Speak so about they, that. they, oh, so you, they look at the video, uh, they your learn employees don't it. even know. <laughs> So they don't know, and probably they will know now. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so it's, this is not why they joined the company. Uh, but yes, we, we have the great place to work certification, and it helps. But it's just the result, as everything we do, is just something, yeah. it's, it's not just only a stamp we want to have. Uh, I think it's very important to be completely aligned uh, with our values and the way we do business. I mean, as you understood, our business is made is, is really to create value for everyone involved, to uh, uh, to give more money back to the locals, to uh, help the travelers um, traveling smartly, and for the employees also is to uh, is to uh, we don't really we really want them to consider they belong to something greater than them, that they belong to an adventure that we had a dream and we are realizing it. This is why we are very transparent about the strategy, about where we come from. So we spend a lot of time with the newcomers to explain what we do. So uh, I think this is why, I mean, they are happy because they say it, we had the certification. It's not because we have a baby foot or something. Yes, we have a baby foot, but um, I think everybody in the company, and we are 200 now, they know uh, what is their contribution to something that has sense, that creates something a bit better one is uh, existing. And this is why I think they are happy. And I personally think that when you are happy in your job, you are efficient. So uh, we try to make people happy when they work, uh, to help them working on the tasks they like to do. If you don't like doing something, you won't be good at it. So uh, the idea, I mean, is to be uh, quite pragmatic. Uh, so we are engineers and we're pragmatic, so we try to uh, to, to find everyone, find, to, to help everyone finding the, the right place and uh, the right team. Yeah, and, it's uh, a virtuous yeah. circle. 
Yeah. Definitely. I, I was asking because I uh, stalked, I guess, you on Glassdoor, uh, at least your company, and you have an amazing rating of 4.6 uh, out of 5, um, the company in terms of, yeah. Okay, great. You didn't know? <laughs> well, now you know. And they, the, your employees also give you, the personally, the rating of uh, 100% they would <laughs> <laughs> approve you. Okay. Um, it's 100% approved, the CEO. So I wanted to ask you what, as a CEO, as a founder, um, what action do you concretely, I don't know, yeah, put in place so that the, these, your employees have this uh, um, so-called amazing view of you and your job? Uh, <laughs> Uh, actually, we are two CEOs. We are two co-CEOs. So I don't know if they rate me or ah, him maybe or that's the <laughs> two of us. Uh, so we are two that's co-founders. So one. I take that rate for uh, both of us. Um, I think it's about transparency. Uh, um, they know what that what we say, we do it, and what we do, we say it. So it's very important, I think. Um, I think we recruit people that have our values. Uh, we have uh, written our values and every time we, uh, we interview people, we try to, uh, to go through the list of values and to understand if they match the values or not. And if we recruit the, the, the people who have the same values, I mean, the teamwork is great. And people, what they value when they arrive in the company is that they have a great uh, team to work with and people care for them. And if there are questions, everybody will be happy to answer. So there is no politics. And people hate politics, and I see more and more people coming from big corporates uh, uh, who want to work in startups like ours because they, I mean, uh, they, they don't want politics anymore and to play games. And in most of companies, this is the case. So I think this, we are a company where we don't play games and we, we can easily communicate. And probably this is what they rate, yes. And do you apply that to your community of local agents as well? The transparency, the, the whole values? Yes, um, so we explain also our local agents what is our strategy, where we go. Uh, we also are very human, I would say. Uh, it's not, I mean, we are a digital uh, website, uh, digital company, but behind, I mean, digital is not, uh, um, I mean, we have to put human behind that. I mean, our job is to connect people together. So uh, we want to show every time we can that we are a human company and that we reconciliate technology and uh, human expertise, human relationships. Uh, this is why, for example, in September we will celebrate our 10th year, 10th year anniversary with our local agents. So there will be people from everywhere in the world, 200 people coming to Paris to celebrate with us and to share good practices. And we organize also lots of trainings in the destinations for local agents so that they can share their expertise. So we put during three days 20 to 30 people uh, in a room and they share. We, we train them to, to tools, to, uh, to good practices, to sustainability as well. So, um, I mean, being only digital technology algorithm is something that will not work in our industry, I think. So we try to take the better of uh, human and technology. Yeah. yeah. Okay, and so speaking about the relationship within, uh, with, between the, um, the founder company and their, its ecosystem, the partners, um, yeah, all the third parties, do you have, Elizabeth, some best practices from company who manage their external community super well? Um, yeah, well, I think uh, Nature Découverte has done that uh, very, very interestingly. We, I was discussing, with, especially with suppliers, but also yeah. local ecosystems like local NGOs working on environmental issues uh, with the stores organizing activities like education activity, educational activities for clients. Uh, I think we have also in the French community of Big Corps, uh, Big Mama, uh, which is doing really well in uh, both re <laughs> well recruiting <laughs> with the Italian ecosystem or Italian food ecosystem, including uh, Italian, uh, not only Ita Italian employees, but also Italian cook, but also Italian suppliers. Uh, so, but, and this is not limited to big ops. So obviously working with suppliers, co-innovating with suppliers, uh, working with um, employees, former employees, future employees, uh, students, whatever, they like the, the potential stakeholders you can work with. Um, with something that's value-based or impact-driven uh, or purpose-focused, whatever, uh, is, is really, um, I mean, it's like creativity. You can, it can take almost any form. 
Yeah, and so uh, Thomas, you work with a community of winemakers, right? Yeah. How do you manage that? How do you manage to create a community of winemakers and how it makes a difference for your business? Um, we have like 40 or, f or 50 winemakers. Uh, we are very... Um, uh, we, it's not friendship between us, but we are very uh, uh, close, yeah, thank you, cl uh, close with them. So, um, yeah, we, we can discuss, we can... Um, uh, when one when, 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 when maker uh, has a question, we, we can um, m make him contact another one and, and they share good practices, etc. Uh, because e every one of them uh, are looking for the best way to produce, and for each region, they have uh, other ways of producing. So uh, it's very interesting. And I guess it reflects really good on you and your business because then they like to work with you because yeah. you are creating this whole community. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We have a very good relation with them and we will soon announce uh, new things very interesting for Pinot Bleu. And it's only a fruit of the, the relation we have with the winemakers. So it's very cool for us also. I was going to say, it's just a matter of creating a, not only a community of, of, uh, of people trading together, but really, as Eric was describing, a community of knowledge, a community of values, a community of commitments. So all these can be shared. The, you, many companies that are actually good on sustainability, they actually train their suppliers, they learn from their suppliers. Some of them, even uh, Danone, has created a fund that invests to finance the projects of their suppliers. So if the supplier wants to I don't know, improve I their business in a sustainable way, then they will finance uh, this with a, a zero uh, rate if they lend money. Uh, some work with crowdfunding, uh, many, many way possible ways uh, to do that. And there's even a fair trade company in Switzerland, I think it's Shoba Shoba the name, but I'm not sure, whose suppliers are in fact shareholders of the company. So it, uh, again, the potential is unlimited. Limited. No? Okay. Um, yeah, and I guess my. Last question is, is there any other ways you, you, you just increase the level of care for your different third parties and um, stakeholders? Or do you have any good advice to give, to give the audience? <laughs> Maybe one, of, one advice f for you guys, uh, as you mentioned that many of you want to be entrepreneurs. Uh, I really believe that we have talents. As entrepreneurs, we know or we learn to know how to um, create new things, create new businesses. Um, another question uh, could be how, like Michael Jackson says, uh, I can make, uh, make it a better place, uh, <laughs> how I can find sense, etc. It's a cool question. Best quote of the panel. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, maybe just a message. I think most of people think that if you are sustainable, you will uh, do less money than other companies. And I think yes. this is the contrary. Um, yeah. this, is something, this is something I didn't prove yet, uh, but I really believe that in the long term, the way we operate the business will help us being more profitable than competitors. Um, look at Patagonia, for example. Patagonia, yeah. this is the example we all take, but uh, it's a very profitable company, um, probably more profitable than other textiles companies in the US. So um, I think it's a way, yes, to, to generate more engagement, more commitment from all the stakeholders, including your employees, and to be also uh, more competitive and to, to earn more money. So it's not a choice between being sustainable and, mm. and profitable. I mean, uh, you can do both. Yeah. Yeah, this is a very important point I was going to say. You can, everybody will tell you you need to choose and if you're a committed company, you will make less money, which is maybe true in the short term, huh? but not, o and, and clearly Patagonia, once they decided to shrink their catalog, they said, okay, but we will last more than the average company, okay? So we last over 100 years, which is, so in the short term, it may be right, like if you want to get very rich, you better rob a bank. Okay, so in the short term, it's the good choice, probably the better choice. In the midterm, it's not sure, and in the long term, it's definitely not the, <laughs> the best choice. So it's pretty much the same in entrepreneurship. So, so it's not the or, or either or, either you, you are sustainable or you make money. You can really have both of best worlds, but it needs a 
more effort probably. It takes already takes a lot of effort to become an entrepreneur or to create a business, a successful business. But it takes even more effort, not only for the B, for the assessment <laughs> of B Corp, but really to 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 build a company that can take the assessment. Um, but the good news is there are best practices and good examples in almost every industry. So whatever the industry you are you're interested in or uh, creating a business in, you can look at the bcorporation.net uh, website where you have the whole community. You can search them by sector, by industry, and find big, big examples, whether you're in real estate or wine or whatever. You have examples in, in, in the culture industry, etc. So you can find many examples that will at least convince you that it, this is possible even in your industry, whether you're B2B, B2C, whatever. Uh, they always have our examples. All right, um, it's a wrap, I guess. Thanks a lot for joining us tonight. Thank you. Um, and uh, yeah, let's uh, continue the conversation and you can stay around if you want to talk to any of them. <laughs>